चले वेलकम बैक गाइस नाउ इन दिस क्लास लेट्स बिगिन विद द डीमाइलेटिंग डिसऑर्डर्स लेट्स डिस्कस अबाउट द डीमाइलेटिंग डिसऑर्डर्स इन दिस क्लास ओके इन द सेंट्रल नर्वस सिस्टम पैथोलॉजी वी आर लेफ्ट विद द डीमाइलेटिंग डिसऑर्डर्स नाउ इन दिस क्लास आई विल बी मेनली डिस्कसिंग अबाउट व्हाट आर द डिफरेंट कॉजेस ऑफ द डीमाइलेशन इन द सेंट्रल नर्वस सिस्टम एज़ वेल एज़ द पेरिफेरल नर्वस सिस्टम सो लेट मी कीप इट एज़ सिंपल एज़ पॉसिबल सी द नर्व्स आर देयर द नर्व्स आर सराउंडेड बाय व्हाट बोथ द पेरिफेरल नर्व्स एंड द peripheral nerves as, as well as the the nerves the neurons which are present in the central nervous system the neurons which are present in the peripheral nervous system as well as the neurons which are present in the central nervous system they are having this myelination right so let's see, let me begin with the basics look here sir the neurons in the central nervous system as well as the neurons in the peripheral nervous system both are Myelinated, they are having this myelination. Myelination is helping in, like you know, it's 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 a, like a insulation. It helps in the proper conduction of the electrical impulses. So the neurons in the central nervous system are myelinated by oligodendrocytes, and the neurons in the peripheral nervous system are myelinated by Schwann cells. Okay, the Schwann cells. So oligodendrocytes as well as the Schwann cells are. were the ones responsible for the myelination see if there is any damage to the cells the schwann cells are getting damaged or the oligodendrocytes are getting damaged so there will be absolutely demyelination definitely that's going to cause a demyelination see if this demyelination is occurring to the motor neurons there will be motor deficits okay there will be spastic paralysis or there will be gait abnormalities ataxia the eye movements are not going to be properly seen so that will cause diplopias and there can be sensory deficits also there, there can be tingling sensations there can be paresthesias okay there can be numbness the patient cannot be able to feel the sensations so this demyelination it can happen to the motor neurons it can happen to the sensory neurons okay it can affect the central nervous system it can affect the peripheral nervous system so now in this class okay the topic which there is left over in the central nervous system pathology that we are going to discuss now that's the demyelinating disorders so the first demyelinating disorder that i am going to discuss in this class is going to be multiple multiple sclerosis okay multiple sclerosis okay see what exactly is this multiple sclerosis ms multiple in the name itself it's a multiple means multiple places in the central nervous system multiple places in the brain as well as spinal cord there is a sclerosis means there is a damage to the neurons that is happening and that's causing the sclerosis plaque plaque deposition fibrosis is happening multiple sclerosis sir. now in this multiple sclerosis what exactly is happening sir it is autoimmune see this autoimmune condition a, a ms is a autoimmune condition auto immune condition okay it's a autoimmune condition in which the central nervous system is affected it's a autoimmune disorder where the central nervous system is affected central nervous system means what it's a brain and spinal cord so the brain and spinal cord are getting affected okay so it's a brain in the brain demyelination is happening as well as spinal cord okay in the brain and spinal cord the demyelination is happening okay seen in which way, like it's seen in uh, which sex uh, so it's autoimmune disease as it's autoimmune disease you just think logically and tell me which sex is going to be most commonly affected females so all the autoimmune disorders are going to be seen in females mainly okay it is not it doesn't mean it's only seen in females yes it's seen in males also but mainly okay mainly seen in females so in which age group so usually the females of 20 to 30s okay so 20 years or 30 years are going to get this multiple uh, sclerosis multiple sclerosis so there are different patterns of the multiple sclerosis okay there are different types i can say where the most common type is if the patient is having multiple sclerosis the most common type is called as i will tell you what exactly it is but let me tell you what is this okay so the most common type of multiple sclerosis is relapsing relapsing and remitting type okay the most common type is relapsing and relapsing, uh, remitting type that's the most common which means see the symptoms are going to occur like this for example the symptoms will come for example lava person symptoms will come and again the person will come back to normal again the symptoms will come again he will come back to normal but with little deficits again after some times the symptoms will come again he will coming to not exactly normal little bit more uh, destruction is happening with every time with every time say multiple multiple times it's going to come 
Okay, so multiple times it's going to occur. With every attack, the patient is going to have a more severe symptoms and more residual symptoms are going to be there. So that is called as relapsing remitting time. Okay, certain forms are going to be like continuously, the multiple sclerosis is happen, happening continuously without any, uh, without any, the, without any uh, getting back to normal, without the person getting back to normal, the continuously it can be seen. But for your exams, the most important point is the most common form of multiple sclerosis is relapsing remitting variety. Come, go, come, go. Okay, so that's the thing. Now it's associated uh, with certain viruses, sir. Okay, so this is also a question. So multiple sclerosis, is it associated with any infection? Yes, associated with associated with Epstein Barr virus. Okay, Epstein Barr virus. And in these patients who are having multiple sclerosis, it is seen that these patients are having interleukin 2 and interleukin 7 receptor polymorphism. Interleukin and interleukin 7 MCQs, interleukin 2 and interleukin 7 receptor polymorphism. See, these things are observed in a patient with multiple sclerosis. So, one of the important points which you should know regarding the multiple sclerosis, guys, multiple sclerosis, autoimmune disorder, young female in her early 30s or 20s, now she is having the problems of sensory deficits or motor deficits. What are the problems that I will explain you? The patient is having some, like, you know, some clinical features are there that I will explain you, but usually they will come and go. They will come and go. Relapsing and remitting variety is the most common type associated with the Epstein Barr virus. And also in these patients, what we have seen is interleukin 12 and interleukin 17 polymorphism that is seen in these patients. Apart from this, what else you should know? So, what is the pathogenesis? Why? Why? why what exactly is happening here? Pathogenesis. The pathogenesis is this is the type 4. Hypersensitive reaction, type 4 hypersensitive reaction, type 4 hypersensitive reaction means what? In type 4 hypersensitive reaction, that is the cell mediated immunity, okay, cell mediated. Which cell mediated sir? The T cells, T lymphocytes, okay, T cells. Now, do you know what these T cells will do? Now, these T cells will do some overaction. Now, these T cells, what they will do is they will consider the myelin. Okay, our myelin as an antigen, okay, especially a myelin basic protein, there is something called as, in the myelin, there is a protein called as myelin basic antigen, okay, there is myelin basic antigen. Now, this myelin basic antigen is the target, okay, now, the myelin basic protein is our own thing. Okay, it's not an antigen. Okay, it's our own thing. It's not something foreign. But in these conditions, these patients who are having multiple sclerosis, now their T cells will recognize this myelin as an antigen, myelin basic protein as an antigen. Now they will go and attack the myelin basic protein. Antigen is getting uh, the myelin is getting attacked. Now these activated T cells during this process, they will also produce something called as um, interferon gamma. Now, this interferon gamma, it will recruit, okay, it will call more and more macrophages into the brain. Macrophages. Now, these macrophages will come and will start to, uh, start to do the phagocytosis of this myelin. So, the point which I want you to know is, it's the cells that are causing the inflammation. It's the cells, okay, the T cells are causing the destruction to the myelin. The T cells are leading to the damage to the myelin. So, what happened to the neurons? Now, the neurons are getting demyelinated. Now, the neurons are getting demyelinated. So, which cells are involved? T cells. Which type of hypersensitivity reaction? Type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. Because type 4 hypersensitivity means the cell mediated, not the antibodies. Not the antibodies. Cell mediated. Of course, in, in this condition, uh, multiple sclerosis, of course, antibodies are also involved. There is no doubt antibodies are involved. B lymphocytes, plasma cells, they are also involved. But mainly, it is the T cells, T cells are attacking the antigen, okay. Now, sir, in multiple sclerosis, what are the clinical features, okay. Multiple sclerosis is there, there is a demyelination. Where demyelination? Both in central nervous system, so that is both in brain as well as spinal cord. Both in brain as well as spinal cord, there is a demyelination that is happening. There is a demyelination of the neurons. So, what are the clinical features? Let me write here. Clinical features. Now, sir, 
this uh, the main, the most common clinical features you see this female who is going to come to the clinic who is going to show up in the clinic and she will say so these days i am getting more fatigue okay i am getting easily fatigue so fatigability fatigability easy fatigability she is getting easy fatigue especially she will say sir i am getting uh, easily fatigue especially after the hot baths after taking a hot bath Okay, this is a keyword. This is the keyword to identify a case of multiple sclerosis. Okay, usually the heart environment or the heart things. Okay, the heart bath. Now she is in a heart environment. Normally, heart environment decreases the neurotransmission. Normally, heart environment decreases the neurotransmission. Already, she is having multiple sclerosis. She is having a demyelination. So proper nerve conduction is not happening. Proper impulse conduction. Okay, the proper electrical impulse conduction is not happening upon which now she is in a heart environment. So, whenever take after taking the heart bath, she will be easily getting fatigue. Proper nerve conduction is not there. So, proper contraction now she can't able to take the work. Okay, extreme fatigability is seen. Apart from that, what else? Sir? What else is very important keyword optic neuritis. Okay, optic neuritis. Especially this is a unilateral condition. Okay, it's a unilateral condition in one eye. So, what exactly is optic neuritis? The optic nerve is getting affected, inflamed. The optic nerve is getting inflamed. Now, some of the students will have it out here. So, optic nerve, which cranial nerve? Optic nerve is the second cranial nerve. Okay, optic nerve is the second cranial nerve. So, cranial nerves are coming under peripheral nervous system. Okay, cranial nerves are coming under the peripheral nervous system. Then, why the optic nerves are getting affected? Why the optic nerves are getting affected? Can you tell me? See, cranial nerve, right? It's a optic nerve is a cranial nerve. Number two, it's coming under the peripheral nervous system. What I have taught you, multiple sclerosis is the demyelination in the central nervous system. So, you should understand, so the cranial nerve number, cranial nerve number two, that's the optic nerve. See, optic nerve, though it is, though it is peripheral nerve, yes, it's a peripheral nerve. But, it is myelinated by what? It's myelinated by oligodendroglial cells. It's myelinated by the oligodendrocytes. See, these oligodendrocytes are the targets. In the multiple sclerosis, the T cells will attack the oligodendrocytes. It will cause a death of the oligodendrocytes. It will cause damage to the oligodendrocytes and it will cause a demyelination. So, the important point is these patients who are having multiple sclerosis, they will be having optic neuritis. Okay. So, that optic neuritis can cause blurring of the vision. Okay, blurred vision. Okay, blur blurring of the vision or there can be visual loss also. Okay. Visual loss. Okay, for a certain period of time, there will be visual loss. And after some time, okay, after a few days, that vision might come back. Okay, why? Because this multiple sclerosis demyelination is happening. The myelination is lost. See, it's a relapsing remitting variety, right? Relapsing remitting variety, which is most common. So, there are symptoms for a certain time and again becoming normal. Means during the normal period, during the normal period, the eyesight can come back. Okay, so relapsing, remitting, relapsing, remitting, going off, coming again, going off, coming again. So, there can be visual loss, which is not permanent. Okay, temporary vision loss can be there. Again, it can come back. Next, ataxia. These patients can have ataxia. Because the gait is normally controlled by the cerebellum. The gait is controlled by the cerebellum. Now, there is a demyelination that can occur in the cerebellum that can lead to ataxia. These patients can have ataxia, nystagmus. Nystagmus can be seen. Next, these patients are also going to have something called as MLF syndrome. So, what exactly is MLF syndrome? MLF syndrome means medial longitudinal fasciculus syndrome. Medial longitudinal fasciculus. So, there is something called as a medial longitudinal fasciculus. Okay, in our central nervous system, there is something called as a medial longitudinal fasciculus. This medial longitudinal fasciculus is the one which helps in the coordinated movement of our eyes. Okay, coordinated movement of our eyes. See, for example, if I am having this right gaze, for example, I am saying right side. Now, this right eye is moving laterally and this left eye will come to medially. Okay. Now, if I am seeing towards the left side, so if I am having the left, left gaze, 
if I am looking like, looking like this, this left eye is going to go laterally and this right eye will come medially. So, there is a proper coordination in the eye movements. So this proper coordination is due to the structure called as a medial longitudinal fasciculus which is present in the brainstem. Okay, medial longitudinal fasciculus. If this medial longitudinal fasciculus is affected in the multiple sclerosis, if demyelination is happening in this particular part, so that will cause intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. Okay, means there is no proper eye coordination that will cause the diplopia. So, this MLF syndrome is going to cause intra, sorry, not intra, inter-nuclear ophthalmoplegia. Means in between the different eye nucleus, okay, there is a, normally a proper coordination is there between the different nucleuses, okay, different nuclei which will cause the proper coordination of the eye. So, that internuclear means in between the nucleus, the proper coordination is going to be lost because of the demyelination, okay, that will cause weakening in the eye movement, that will cause weakening in the eye movement, properly the eyes are not moving, the left eye is moving towards, for example, this eye, the left eye is moving towards the left, but this eye which was supposed to move towards the medial side is not moving. So, that will cause incoordinated eye movements that will lead to diplopia. Okay, that will cause diplopia, sir. Next, what else? So, these patients are in the central nervous system and along with the peripheral nervous system is the one which is involved in the autonomic activities. So, these patients will have severe, okay, uh, dysfunction in the autonomic activities. So, these patients can have severe dysfunction in the autonomic activities, autonomic dysfunction, autonomic dysfunction. Okay, it is autonomous, it is autonomic nervous system which is responsible for the breathing. This autonomic nervous system is controlling the heart rate, the bladder contractions. So, especially these patients are going to have bladder dysfunction, bladder dysfunction, bladder dysfunction, okay, bladder dysfunction. So, because the contraction of the bladder is under the control of the autonomic nervous system, bladder contraction, bladder relaxation. So, if the neurons which are present in the autonomic nervous system, the neurons which are present in the autonomic nervous system, if they are damaged, that can cause a bladder dysfunction, it can cause a sexual dysfunction, okay, sexual dysfunction because the penile erection, uh, the ejaculation, they are all the autonomic activities, sympathetic and parasympathetic activities, so there can be sexual dysfunction. Okay, so these are the important points which I want you to know. So these patients, especially seen, this is seen in the young females of 20s and 30s, she's going to have very much fatigability. That's a key thing, very much fatigability, especially after taking the heart baths and the heart environment. She's going to have optic neuritis. Since the second cranial nerve is involved, this is very, very important for the multiple sclerosis. Second cranial nerve is involved, optic neuritis is going to be there, intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, diplopia is going to be seen. Okay, because the second cranial nerve is innervated by the oligodendrocytes, not the Schwann cells. Next, cerebellar involvement can cause the ataxia, nystagmus, okay, and there can be autonomic dysfunction like bladder dysfunction or sexual dysfunction. Now, how to put the diagnosis? What is the diagnosis, sir? MRI is the gold standard. Okay, MRI is the gold standard. So, when you do the MRI, okay, when you do the MRI, let me show you here itself. Uh, first, let me tell you what is seen and let me uh, later show you what, the, what is seen in the MRI image, okay. So, the patients who are having uh, this multiple sclerosis on MRI, there will be periventricular plaques. Periventricular plaques. These plaques are nothing but the areas of the demyelination where the oligodendrocytes are gone, damaged. So, there will be periventricular plaques which are seen. You know the ventricles, right? Ventricles, the ventricles, uh, that is the paraseal, diocele, means the fluid filled cavities in the brain, the CSF. Okay, CSF is there in the ventricles. So, there will be periventricular, periventricular plaques. Periventricular plaques are seen. See, these periventricular plaques are the areas, they are nothing but the areas where there is loss of oligodendrocytes. Now, why the oligodendrocytes are lost? The oligodendrocytes are lost because the T cell, T cell mediated injury, the T cells have gone there, they have attacked the myelin, they have attacked the oligodendrocytes and killed the oligodendrocytes. Now, let me show you the image, MRI image. Sir, look here. This is a patient. Okay. See, this is the ventricles, you know. These are the ventricular areas. See, periventricular. Okay. Do you have, you see this finger-like projections. So, this periventricular demyelination. See, the white color, the white color, the periventricular plaques. These are called as the periventricular plaques. So, this periventricular plaques 
are very much seen in multiple sclerosis. When you see it, it's a immediate diagnosis. Periventricular blocks, multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis. Okay. Now here also you can very clearly see around the ventricles. Okay, these are the ventricles. Around the ventricles, you can see these white white colors. Okay, see what are these white areas? So these white areas are the areas of demyelination. Demyelination. Okay, these areas. Okay. So these are the areas of demyelination. Periventricular blocks. Next. What else you should know for your exam? Let me tell you one more thing. So normally myelin, normally myelin is stained by. Okay, when you take a biopsy, okay, just take a biopsy. When you take a biopsy, if you want to stain the myelin, what is the stain used? Stain for myelin. Stain for myelin. The stain for myelin is Luxal Fast. Okay, so when you take a brain biopsy and you put it, just stain it with a Luxal Fast and put it under a microscope in a patient who is having multiple sclerosis. Now, what you will see, definitely there will be certain areas where not, which are not stained with myelin. So, let me show you that image also, now itself, image based question. So, look here, see, the Luxal Fast, the blue stain, okay, see, these are the normal areas, okay, the yellow color which is representing over here, the normally appearing white matter, okay, the normally appearing white matter, okay. Next, this red color areas, shadow plaque or remyelinated plaque, I have said you, Relapsing, remitting, relapsing, remitting. First, there will be an attack. Demyelination followed by remyelination. Remyelination occurs. Demyelination, remyelination, demyelination, demyelination. So many multiple, multiple attacks will be occurring. Okay. So with every attack, more symptoms, more symptoms, more symptoms. So this green color, okay, the green color arrow, arrows, see these are the areas in the white matter. Okay, are you able to see? In the white matter, here, yeah, there is this area of demyelination. The point which I want you to know is, the blue color areas which you are seeing, they are the myelinated areas. Luxal's fast is the stain used. Myelin will look blue color. There is a white color. That white color is indicating the area which is undergoing demyelination. Okay, demyelination. Okay. So, this is also completed. Image based question. Next, this is also uh, not this one. Yeah, this one. So, periventricular. Periventricular white color. That's a demyelination. Periventricular plaques. Here also, periventricular plaques. Image-based questions are also completed, sir. Now, after this, after multiple sclerosis, now next, let's discuss about one more di uh, demyelinating disorder. The next demyelinating disorder that I'm going to discuss is called as Guillain Barre syndrome, okay? Guillain Barre, some, some people will call it as Guillain Barre syndrome or some people will call it as Guillain Barre syndrome. Most, mostly, it, it should be called as a Guillain Barre syndrome, okay? So what exactly is this Guillain Barre syndrome or Guillain Barre syndrome? Look, multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disorder in central nervous system. In central nervous system, that is a brain and spinal cord. Okay, if demyelination is happening, that is a multiple sclerosis. Now this Guillain Barre syndrome. Okay, this Guillain Barre syndrome. One minute. Okay, Guillain Barre syndrome. Sir, so in Guillain Barre syndrome, what exactly is happening? It is a demyelination of peripheral nervous system. Okay, it is a demyelination of peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is getting demyelinated. Okay, which means which cells are getting affected? Sir, now here the targets, it is also autoimmune condition. This is also autoimmune condition. Okay, autoimmune condition means definitely it is going to be also affected, is seen in the females. Okay, autoimmune condition. Now here, the Schwann cells are the targets, not the oligodendrocytes. Schwann cells. Schwann cells. Now Schwann cells are what? Schwann cells are the myelinating cells in the peripheral nervous system. Schwann cells are damaged. The Schwann cells are getting damaged. Schwann cells are destroyed by the immune system. Now in this Guillain-Barre syndrome, now the key word which I want you to know is, so there is something called as the ascending paralysis. Ascending paralysis. 
So what exactly is this ascending paralysis? Usually the patient is going to have the symptoms, okay, the symptoms in the lower extremities, the paralysis, the weakening of the muscles, the weakening of the muscles, it will start in the lower extremities. Because to, for the muscle contraction, what do you need? For the muscle contraction, what do you need, guys? You need the neurons. Okay, it's the alpha motor neuron you need. Alpha motor neurons, where they are present? They are present in the spinal nerves. Spinal nerves are which nerves? Peripheral nervous system. Spinal nerves are the peripheral nerves. Cranial nerves are the peripheral nerves. So, what is happening? The peripheral nerves are getting affected. It's the peripheral nerves which causes the contraction, right? Contraction of the muscles. So, these patients are go going to have, especially the weakening, the paralysis will start in the legs. From the legs, the paralysis will ascend up. From the legs, to the trunk, to the thorax, to the upper limbs, something like that. So, there will be ascending paralysis. So, starting from the legs, ascends up. Okay, it ascends up to the other areas. Other areas means upper areas. Okay, so that is the uh, ascending paralysis. See, ascending paralysis is seen in Guillain Barre syndrome. But now itself, I want you to know, note, so where do you see? Where do you see descending paralysis? Descending paralysis. Ascending paralysis, Guillain Barre syndrome. Autoimmune destruction of Schwann cells. Demyelinating disorder of peripheral nervous system. Then where you see the descending paralysis? Descending paralysis, it is seen in a condition called as the descending paralysis is seen in a condition which is called as a botulism. Okay, botulism because of this microorganism called as a Clostridium botulinum. This Clostridium botulinum is going to produce a toxin called as a botulin. That botulin will inhibit the uh, will inhibit the release of the acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction that will cause a flaccid paralysis, especially in the babies. That's a descending paralysis. I, won't, I don't want to go into that detail, that micro detail. There is an organism called as Clostridium botulinum. It will produce a toxin called as a botulin. That botulin can cause a disease called as a botulism where the paralysis is going to be descending in order. Okay, starting to go, going to start from the upper areas and it will move down. The paralysis, the weakening of the muscles descend. Okay, it goes down. That's the point. One more thing about this Guillain Barre syndrome. So, in this <coughs> Guillain Barre syndrome, it is associated with what? It is associated with what? Associated with multiple sclerosis is associated with, I have explained you the two things the genetic thing, interleukin, see, interleukin 2 and interleukin 7 polymorphism and associated with the Epstein Barr virus. Epstein Barr virus. But here, the Guillain Barre syndrome, it is associated with what? Right? With a parasite which is going to uh, affect the intestines, the jejunum. So, associated with. Camphylobacter. Jejuni. Okay, Camphylobacter jejuni. So, Camphylobacter jejuni, the, those patients who are having infection with Camphylobacter jejuni, are shown to have, okay, previous history of cam, uh, Campylobacter jejuni, these patients are shown to have this Guillain-Barre syndrome, okay, or Guillain-Barre syndrome, that one thing. Second thing, this is one, association, second association is CMV, cytomegalovirus. So, usually the cytomegalovirus, okay, usually the cytomegalovirus is not going to show any problems in you and me. For example, we all have, we all, sometime in our life, sometime in our life, we all have infected with the cytomegalovirus, but cytomegalovirus is not going to cause any problem in a patient who is having proper immune system, okay, proper immune system. But those patients who are immunocompromised, okay, those patients who are immunocompromised, are uh, those patients who are ha having this transplant, transplant patients, okay, now the patient is having a kidney transplant who is on the immunosuppressant drugs. Now in this patient, the cytomegalovirus can cause a lot of problems. So the point which I want you to know is, sir, what are the infections which are associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Sir, the Guillain-Barre syndrome, it is associated with Campylobacter jejuni and cytomegalovirus. Okay, these two things also I want you to know. What are the clinical features? Sir? What kind of clinical features are there? See, the clinical features are going to be respiratory failure. See, it's an ascending paralysis, right? It starts from the leg, okay. See, there is leg paralysis, nothing will happen. Okay, the patient will have, like, can't able to do his own work, okay. But what will cause the death, sir, actually, is the respiratory failure. Why? Because the diaphragm is also a skeletal muscle. It should contract. Who will contract the diaphragm? The phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve is what? It's a peripheral nerve, right? It's a peripheral nerve. So, 
Now, clinical features are going to be respiratory okay, failure. Our respiratory first initially distress will be there that can lead to respiratory failure okay? and that can actually kill the patient. Now, that is the one thing which I want you to know. Second thing, see so the muscles, the facial muscles. See, there is expression in my, in my face when I am talking, there is some expression, okay, laughing, crying, and there will be some expression because of the contraction of the facial muscles. Now, in this patient, the ascending paralysis is happening. So, even this facial muscles will become paralyzed so that you cannot have any expression. So, facial muscle weakness. Facial muscle weakness. Okay. So, the good thing part, the good part is, so these conditions will resolve generally within months, this condition, like you know, the symptoms, whatever have came, that will be resolved, okay, after some time, okay, after a certain time, in may, most of the patients, this auto, the symptoms will automatically resolve, okay. So, respiratory failure will be there, a facial muscle weakness, these patients can have so, uh, symptoms like paresthesias, like numbness, okay. So, respiratory failure, facial muscle weakness, paresthesias, and these patients are also going to have autonomic dysfunction. Okay, autonomic dysfunction. In autonomic dysfunction, what is the most important thing you are always, you should remember, it's a bladder. Bladder dysfunction, no proper urination is going to happen, like you know, bladder dysfunction. In 70% of the cases, 70% of the cases of the guillain barre syndrome are going to have the bladder dysfunctions. Okay, and tachycardias can be seen. So this is an important point. So, these patients, because of this tachycardia, okay, autonomic dysfunction, tachycardia, this tachycardia can actually kill the patient, sir. That's one of the most common cause of death. So, that is the going that is going to cause sudden cardiac death. Uncontrolled tachycardia can actually kill the patient. Sudden cardiac deaths. Okay. These patients can have uh, hypotension, hypotension, paralysis of the GIT, that is the ileus. Ileus can be seen, urinary retention can be seen. Let me write here tachycardia, hypotension. Or hypertension, hypotension or hypertension. See, it's a BP is not properly getting regulated. It's our autonomic nervous system which is all the time properly regulating the BP, always properly maintaining the BP. It's the autonomic nervous system who is constantly maintaining my heart rate. I am not maintaining my heart rate. It's the autonomic nervous system is maintaining the heart and the tachycardia, the bradycardia, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. Now, in these patients, so this cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. Okay, cranial nerve is the vagus, vagus, vagus is like, you know, maintaining the heart rate, bradycardia. It's the sympathetic nerves which increases the heart rate. So, the vagus nerve and the cardiac nerves, the cardiac nerves and the sympathetic nerves, they are the part of peripheral nervous system, right? Now, they are getting demyelinated, no proper conduction, no proper conduction, no proper regulation of the heart rate. That can lead to tachycardia and even sometimes bradycardia also. So, tachycardia, bradycardia, hypotension or hypertension, there can be GIT paralysis that is called as ileus. The ileus can be seen or bladder dysfunction that is a urinary retention. Okay, urinary retention. Okay, he is not going for the urination. He is not able to go for the urination. Okay, urinary retention can be seen or sometimes more urination can be seen. Okay, more urination can be seen sometimes. So, these are all the bladder functions that can be. Uh, these are the, these are the autonomic dysfunctions that can be seen. Next thing, sir. What is seen in the CSF? What is seen in the CSF? Okay, sir, labs. So, one thing I forgot, sorry, one thing I forgot in the multiple sclerosis. In the multiple sclerosis, I forgot something which is very, very important. In a patient who is having multiple sclerosis, MRI will show periventricular plaques. Okay, MRI, let me add here itself, I forgot MRI will show periventricular plaques. That image also I have shown you, that finger-like projections around the periventricular areas. What is shown in the labs or CSF, if you do CSF examination, okay, by spinal tap, okay, by lumbar puncture, now you have collected the CSF. Now, in this CSF, do you know what is seen? Sir, it is the oligodendrocytes that are dying, okay. It is the oligodendrocytes that are dying. It is a myelin, myelin, it is a myelin that is getting destroyed. So, in the CSF, you will see high levels of myelin basic protein. The protein in CSF will increase. The myelin basic protein, which protein, sir? Myelin basic protein is increased. Okay, myelin basic proteins. Apart from this, you can also see oligoclonal IgG bands. Okay, oligoclonal, these are the antibodies, sir. Okay, oligoclonal IgG 
IgG bands. Means antibodies, lots and lots of IgG antibodies that are seen. High protein, high amount of myelin basic protein, lots of IgG antibodies that are present in the CSF. So whenever you see this myelin basic protein in the CSF, myelin basic protein in the CSF, you should always think about that is multiple sclerosis, oligoclonal IgG bands in the CSF, that is multiple sclerosis. Okay, but there are no such things in Guillain Barre syndrome. And this Guillain Barre syndrome, there are no such things. No such things. Yes, protein levels, CSF protein levels will increase. Protein levels will increase. But apart from that, nothing. Okay, there is no such thing as oligoclonal IgG bands. They are not seen, sir. Okay, they are usually not seen. Normal cell count. There is no neutrophil, no B cells, nothing. Normal cell count. Normal cell count. In multiple sclerosis, in multiple sclerosis, the T cell count might increase, but here the normal cell, cell count is going to be there. What is the treatment? Treatment for Guillain Barre syndrome. So that Guillain Barre syndrome treatment is going to be respiratory support. These patients are at a risk of respiratory failure, ascending paralysis, respiratory failure. So this patient should have respiratory support. Okay, respiratory support. And uh, these patients. We don't know exact reason why, we don't know exact reason why, how this is helping, but plasmapheresis means plasmapheresis is just the filtration, filtration of the plasma. Usually in plasmapheresis, we remove the antibodies. If there is any abnormal antibody that is present, we will remove that antibodies. So even in multi and multiple sclerosis, you can go with the plasmapheresis. Even in this condition, you can go with the plasma pheresis. Okay, the plasma phoresis can be done in this condition. We don't know the exact reason why these patients are also very much responsive to intravenous immunoglobulins, IVIGs, intravenous immunoglobulins, giving intravenous immunoglobulins, going for the para, uh, plasma phoresis and giving respiratory support will show the better results in these patients. Okay, usually in guillain barre syndrome, the patients will resolve within months. Okay, he'll come back to his normal state. So guillain barre syndrome, what exactly it is? It is autoimmune. Okay, it's autoimmune problem. Here also there is a demyelination of the peripheral nervous system. Ascending paralysis will be seen. Schwann cells are going to be damaged. Okay. Ascending paralysis means paralysis that is starting from the legs and it is ascending up associated with infections like Campylobacter jejuni and cytomegalovirus. What are the problems? Respiratory problem, facial muscle weakness, parasthesias, okay, sensory deficits. Parasthesias can be seen. Autonomic dysfunction like bladder dysfunction. Okay, bladder dysfunction can be seen. Tachycardia can be seen. Bradycardia can be seen. Uh, there can be hypertension or hypertension, gastric paralysis like ileus can be seen. Okay, these are the important points. I found this image in the internet, which is like, no, I like this image. Let me show you. Okay, just like uh, mnemonic, it, it will help you. Mnemonic, see, guillain barre syndrome. Okay, guillain barre syndrome. In this guillain barre syndrome, see, there is an arrow which is showing up, which means ascending paralysis. Okay, see, it's a symmetrical muscle paralysis, which usually begins in the legs and it ascends up. Okay, usually begins in the... Uh, legs and ascends up. One more point which I want you to know here, I, I just want to show this image because, see, uh, multiple sclerosis is usually seen in a female of 20, 20s and 30s. This guillain barre syndrome is usually seen in older individuals, 50s, 50s, 60s, okay. So, guillain barre syndrome is seen in older patients, okay, in older patients. See, the most cases preceded, okay, most cases are preceded by Campylobacter jejuni enteritis, Campylobacter jejuni. Okay, so first Campylobacter jejuni infection. After getting this infection, see if you are having Campylobacter jejuni infection, what will happen? There will be bloody diarrhea. Okay, there will be bloody diarrhea. So usually patient knows. So, sir, previously I am having this infection. I got this bloody diarrhea and I got diagnosed that I am having this Campylobacter jejuni. Now, after this, I am having the symptoms, sir, the bladder dysfunction, tachycardias, like, you know, the paresthesias, ascending paralysis, I cannot use my limbs, it's very hard for me to, difficult, uh, it's hard for me to go for, uh, like, you know, to do the respiration. So, this is the important point, Campylobacter jejuni infection. So, the patient is going to have paresthesias, the tingling sensation, numbness in the hands and feet, okay. And, say, so I have said you, it's a respiratory problem, the main problem is the respiration, the skeletal muscles, paralysis, ascending paralysis, severe respiratory muscle weakness. Okay, so definitely these patients have to go on to the respiratory support. Respiratory support, I have told you. Okay, apart from that, what else? I have told you that giving intravenous immunoglobulins as well as plasma pheresis are the mainstays of treatment, are the mainstays of treatment. So, done. Guillain, -Bar Guillain Barre syndrome is completed. Now, after Guillain Barre syndrome, the next thing which I want you to know is from here, now you can go little fast because 
the two conditions we have seen, the two conditions, two demyelinating disorders, one is the multiple sclerosis as well as the Guillain-Barre syndrome, the two conditions where there is a demyelination, one is in the central nervous system, other is in the peripheral nervous system. The next condition is called as a progressive multifocal, progressive multifocal, progressive means progressing, multifocal means in multiple places there is leuco, means the white matter is getting affected means the myelin you go encephalopathy the progressive multifocal you encephalopathy pml okay pml so this is is it an autoimmune condition this progressive multifocal you encephalopathy is it an auto uh, autoimmune uh, like you know is it a uh, autoimmune condition don't know no no it's not an autoimmune condition it is seen with a virus sir okay that is a jc virus okay jc virus usually you and me i have said you many times in our life we have affected with the jc virus okay but usually JC virus don't do any problem to you and me. In a patient who is having immunocompromised state, in immunocompromised individuals where the immune system is very much inactive. So in this immunocompromised individuals, this JC virus, whatever is there in the body, okay, it is it is there in our body, sir, but it is totally inactivated. But in a patient who is having the immunosuppression, immuno, immunocompromised state, the, this JC virus reactivation will occur. This JC virus is the one which is going to cause the demyelination in the brain okay so progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy it's a severe severe condition severe demyelinating disorder right severe demyelinating disorder where in central nervous system okay in central nervous system sir why because of an infection because of an infection See, multiple sclerosis and Guillain-Barre syndrome, they are not because of infections. They are autoimmune. This one, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy is because of a virus. So, reactivation of, of what? Reactivation of JC virus. So, this JC virus is going to be mainly, uh, the reactivation is going to be seen in immunocompromised individuals. The reactivation can be seen in immunocompromised individuals, sir. Okay. So, who are these immunocompromised individuals? Let me tell you. Usually, this progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, it is seen in HIV people. So, this immunocompromised individual, he is nothing but our HIV patient. Okay, it's in HIV patients, especially the CD count. Okay, the CD, the CD4 count. If the CD4 count, if it is less than 200, okay, the CD4 count is less than 200, sir. Okay, less than 200 cells. Less than 200 cells means the CD4 count is falling so much. Immunocompromised state. Now the JC virus is going to activate. The JC virus will cause the inflammation in the brain. It is going to attack. Uh, the, it is going to attack by the immune system. So that will cause the demyelination. Okay, so these patients are going to have slow onset. Okay, means slowly, progressive, that's why progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, slow onset encephalopathy. Slow onset encephalopathy, these patients are usually going to have the first HIV. Later on, they have developed the CNS manifestation, that is a PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, where the patient is going to have altered status. Okay, the patient is going to have altered mental status. Okay. So, focal deficits, the motor, motor deficits can be seen, the sensory deficits can be seen, motor deficits is like, you know, the, the patient cannot, oh, for example, walk, the motor deficits, sir, or the sensory deficits, the patient cannot able to feel the senses, can be seen. So, how to put the diagnosis? How to put the diagnosis is, you just collect the CSF, collect the CSF, in the CSF, just check for the DNA of JC virus. Okay, so collect the CSF and check for the DNA of the JC virus, it will come positive. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Now, how it is going to look on the MRI? Okay, this is also image based question. Now, look. See. Multifocal, multiple places. This is, this, is not, this is just not periventricular. Okay, this is just not the periventricular. Okay, so in multiple, multiple places, you can see such a big things. Okay, so this is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy because of the JC virus, JC virus. Okay, you can also go with the brain biopsy. Okay, you can also do the brain biopsy and you can see this is a demyelination also. Okay. Now, after this, the next 
this is which I want to discuss now. Next demyelinating disorders. What are three demyelinating disorders that I have discussed? Multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, a serious demyelinating disorder which is seen in immunocompromised patients because of the JC virus reactivation. JC virus causing the demyelination. PML completed. The fourth condition which is causing the demyelination is called as charcot. Mary. Tooth. Disease. A charcot Mary tooth disease. Sir, this is because of what? Is it autoimmune? No. Is it because of JC virus? No. It is a hereditary condition. Okay, it's a hereditary condition, gene mutations. So, hereditary, it's a, it's a hereditary motor and sensory neuropathy. Hereditary motor and sensory neuropathy. Now, what is happening in this condition? Charcot Mary tooth disease is the same. Why sensory losses and motor losses? Motor and sensory neuropathy means motor and sensory losses are seen. Why motor and sensory losses are seen, sir? Because of the demyelination. Okay, because of the demyelination. So, why there is demyelination, sir? No virus is there. No, no antibodies are there. See, first of all, in this condition, Charcot Mary tooth disease, the myelin is not produced. The myelin itself is not getting produced, sir. So, there is a defect in the production of myelin. Defect in production of myelin. Okay. It's hereditary peripheral nerve disorder. It's a hereditary peripheral nerve. Mainly in this charcot uh, Mary tooth disease, it's a peripheral nervous system is getting affected. Peripheral nerves. Okay, peripheral nerves. That is the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. Cranial nerves and spinal nerves are going to be affected. The spinal nerves and cranial nerves, they are not properly myelinated. Now, very, very important point is, see, whenever you should you see about this charcot Mary tooth disease, okay, don't think about something related to the tooth. It is a lower extremity, sir. The lower extremities are going to be first affected. Okay, the extremities, there is a muscle wasting. Normally, the nerve should be properly myelinated. The nerves, the nerve should be properly myelinated and this nerve should innervate the muscles. And this nerves, are the ones which will cause the contraction of the muscles in upper extremities, lower extremities, everywhere. But in this condition, what happens is, the nerves are not properly myelinated. So, these nerves will undergo degeneration. The nerves, the, the <coughs> peripheral nerves, they will undergo degeneration. So, the muscles will undergo wasting. The muscles will undergo wasting. So, what, you, what I want you to know is, the leg muscles are wasted. Leg muscles are wasted. Okay, now I will show you the image also. The, do you know how the muscles are going to look like? How, how the legs are going to look like? The, the legs are going to look like the stalk-like contour. Okay, legs are going to look like stalk-like contour. Let me show you first of all. See, look. This is, you know, like there's a crane or stalk. Now, look at his leg. How it is looking like? He's having this high arches. Now, it's looking, it's like, it's, it looks like a stock at the crane so this high arches are going to be seen not only does uh, this but his legs also is going to be very much thin thin limbs atrophied limbs very thin limbs are going to be seen okay so these patients are going to have the foot drop symptoms like foot drop and claw claw hands can be seen okay whenever we talk about the claw hand always the patients will the, the students will think that ulnar nerve palsy not only that so in this condition which is called as a charcot mary to the disease the legs will be first legs affected so stark leg contour can be seen Next, foot to drop can be seen. Apart from foot drop, there can be claw hand. Why all these problems? These are all problems because the nerves are not properly myelinated. Which nerves? The peripheral nerves are not properly myelinated. Okay. So, how many types of charcot Mary tooth disease are there? Sir, actually, for your exam, you should know there are two types. Charcot Mary tooth disease 1, CMT1, CMT. So, in charcot Mary tooth disease 1 and charcot Mary tooth disease 2. What is the problem in charcot Mary tooth disease 1? You already know it. It's a loss of myelin. Okay, loss of myelin in peripheral nervous system. Okay, not proper myelination is happening. Loss of myelin on the peripheral neurons. In charcot Mary tooth disease type 2, there is loss of, there is entire death. Okay, there is loss of peripheral neurons. Not just the myelin, it's the loss. Total peripheral neurons are dead. Okay, loss of peripheral neurons. This is the one difference which I want you to know. In CMT1, it's just the myelin that is not there. 
and in CMT type 2, there is a loss of peripheral neurons. So, the progressive loss, these patients are going to have what? Motor nerves are going to be damaged that causing the feet, like you know, the, that's going to cause the symptoms in the feet and legs and the sensory nerves are going to be affected. Okay, usually the patient will, will have the loss of senses from the hand and feet. Okay, so this is the point which I want you to know. Okay, these patients, that leg image is important, so they are going to have the high arches, so it's going to look like a crane leg. Okay, crane leg, high arches can be a seen. Okay. Now, apart from this, what else I should teach you? See, this uh, leg, which is looking like a crane, this deformity is called as, this deformity with a high arch, this deformity is called as pescavus. Pescavus deformity. This pescavus deformity, pescavus deformity, if they are talking about thin limbs, lower limbs affected, high arches, pescavus deformity, foot drop, okay, foot drop, next, claw hand, okay, claw hand, and it's a, they are talking about some demyelinating disorder that is hereditary in nature, that is charcot Marie tooth disease, charcot Marie tooth disease. After this, the next demyelinating disorder which I want you to know, is called as metachromatic leukodystrophy. Metachromatic, okay, metachromatic leukodystrophy. You know, this is a lysosomal storage disorder. Okay, it's a lysosomal storage disorder. In the name itself, it's a deco. Leuco, leuco means the white matter, the myelin, dystrophy, damaged. First of all, it's a lysosomal storage disorder. Okay, what is the inheritance pattern? The inheritance pattern is going to be autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. What is happening here, sir? In this uh, metachromatic leukodystrophy, the problem is aryl sulfatase deficiency. Aryl sulfatase deficiency. The patient is having this enzyme deficiency, sir. Okay, aryl sulfatase deficiency. Because of this aryl sulfatase deficiency, there is buildup of, okay, there is a buildup of sulfatides. The sulfatides, because this enzyme is deficient, the sulfatides are going to be building up. See, they will impair, see, this building up the sulfatides impair the production of the myelin. Okay, they will cause the impairment in the production of myelin. Okay, so this is a problem, sir. So, in metachromatic leukodystrophy, the lysosomal storage disorder, again, there will be demyelination. No proper myelination is going to occur because of the deficiency of an enzyme called as aryl sulfatase deficiency. Now, where is the demyelination? So, this metachromatic leukodystrophy, is it a demyelinating disorder in the central nervous system or peripheral nervous system? Both central nervous system as well as peripheral nervous system. Demyelination is seen in both central as well as peripheral nervous system. The symptoms are going to be the same, sir. Autonomic dysfunction is going to be seen. That's the thing. Paresthesia, motor deficits, sensory deficits. Okay, simple. The patient is going to have sensory deficits, motor deficits, Parasthesias and these patients are going to have the autonomic dysfunction, bladder dysfunction, tachycardia can be possible. Okay, this metachromatic leukodystrophy. After this, let me talk about one more lysosomal storage disorder which is uh, affecting this white matter that is Krabbe's disease. Krabbe's disease. Sir, in Krabbe's disease, what is the inheritance pattern? Autosomal receive inheritance pattern. So, what is the deficiency? What, which enzyme deficiency, sir? It's a galactosiribrosidase. Galactosiribrosidase deficiency. So because of the deficiency of this galactosiribrosidase, who is getting accumulated galactosiribroside? Galactosiribroside is getting accumulated. So, what this galactosiribroside will do, sir? It's like it's now it acting like a toxin. This galactosiribroside, it is going to destroy the myelin. Destroy myelin. Okay. So, in Krebis disease, what are the important points which I want you to know? Sir, in Krebis disease, the patient is going to have a deficiency of an enzyme called as a galactosiribroside. This galactosiribroside deficiency is going to cause the increase in the galactosiribroside levels or the accumulation of the galactosiribroside within the cells, within the neurons and that's what causes the destruction. It's acting like a toxin. Now, that's what causes the destruction of the myelin. So, it's going to be seen in the children, sir. This Krabbe's disease and metachromatic, leuco, metachromatic leukodystrophy, they are going to be seen from the ch childhood. Childhood. 
So whenever the patient is having the Kravitz disease or metachromatic leukodystrophy, the child is not going to have proper development. So they will be having developmental delay. So they are not going to have their proper milestones. They will not achieve their milestones properly. There will be developmental delay. Progressive mental, uh, sorry, progressive motor and sensory problems can be seen. Developmental delay can be seen. Um, the reflexes which are supposed to be there, which were supposed to come by time, the reflexes are not going to be seen. Absent reflexes can be seen. Apart from that, in the Krabbage disease, one more point I want you to know. Usually these Krabbage babies are going to have microcephaly. Okay, so if a patient is having microcephaly, they are saying the patient is having microcephaly, the developmental delay is seen. Okay, the proper developmental milestones are not achieved. Okay, uh, you can say uh, the sensory losses are there, motor losses are there, the baby is irritable. You can think about Krabbage disease. So at the end of the day, in neurology, what you should know is Krabbage disease. Metachromatic leukodystrophy. Okay, Krabbage disease, metachromatic leukodystrophy. Charcot Mary tooth disease. Okay, Charcot Mary tooth disease. And progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Guillain-Barre syndrome. And multiple sclerosis. All these are the conditions which will cause a demyelination. Okay, which will cause demyelination. Some things will cause demyelination in central nervous system and other things will cause a demyelination in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so with this, it's completed. Krabbage disease is also completed. Okay, next. The leftover topic, the small topic, sir. Okay, the small topic, which is also very much important in the exam. From the neurology, which I want you to know is the headaches. Okay, small topic, but important. Headaches. The treatment they will ask, sir. Headaches. How many types of headaches are there? The headaches are broadly classified into three types. Tension headache. Migraines and clusters okay so tension headache migraine uh, tension headache migraines as well as clusters these are the three types of headaches that are seen so what are the important points about the tension headache see usually we all have we all have the tension headache right you see whenever for your exams okay when you are preparing when you are sitting and when you are looking at the book or when you are looking at the computer screen for a so long time okay so that will cause headache tension headaches Everyone will have the tension headaches, but we don't know the exact reason why the headache is occurring. We don't know. It's poorly understood. So the etiology of all these headaches, tension, migraine, and clusters are not understood. The etiology is not understood. So in tension headache, the important point is the patient is going to have bilateral pain. Okay, bilateral pain. It's like a compressing pain. It looks like someone is compressing your head. You will, see, you will feel like, you know, it's like you know, something is compressing your head. Usually in these tension headaches, there is no photophobia. No photophobia means the, pa the patient is not going to have any problem looking at the lights. But in other types of headaches, okay, especially with the migraine, the patient is going to have the photophobia means they cannot look at the bright light and they cannot hear the sound also. Okay, they will be very much irritated. They cannot, they don't want to look at the light. They don't want to he hear any sounds. So photophobia, no photophobia, no phonophobia, no phonophobia and no aura symptoms. No aura symptoms. So aura symptoms means let I, I will explain you in a minute. Aura symptoms. What are aura symptoms? In tension headache, the tension headache is going to be bilateral. Etiology is not properly understood. The patient is not going to have any photophobia, phonophobia, or aura. How you have to treat this condition? So the treatment is going to be NSAIDs. Okay, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So then, what is the migraine, sir? Migraine. So in migraine, the patient is going to have the unilateral pain unilateral headache on one side the patient is going to have severe headache on one side sir one particular side so these patients are going to have yes photophobia phonophobia and aura symptoms are present now you will have it out sir what are these aura symptoms what exactly is aura symptoms sir means these are non headache symptoms means usually before getting the headache even this person can know now sir i am having these symptoms these are the non headache symptoms See, I will show you the images also. Very important thing is that see, whenever they have these aura symptoms, they will know, sir, I am going to get the migraine. For example, what are these aura symptoms? Let me tell you. Aura means non-headache symptoms. Non-headache symptoms. Like visual symptoms, sir. Okay, the visual symptoms. What are these visual symptoms? What they will see is bright dark spots are scintillating scotomas. Okay, bright. 
dark spots are scintillating. Scintillating scotoma means vision loss. Okay, let me show you the image also. See, look here. See, these are the scintillating scotomas. See, in this area, in the C shape, okay, so there is visual loss in that area. It will automatically, it will go up. Means the patients who are having migraine, before getting the migraine, they will have these symptoms like visual abnormalities can be seen, like this scotomas can be seen, or they will have tingling sensations in the fa hand and face. Now they will understand, sir, now I am going to get the migraine. So these are like warning symptoms, warning symptoms. So these are the ARA symptoms. Usually they will precede head headache. Okay, they will precede the headache. In 25% of the cases, in 25% of the cases who are having uh, ARA, sorry, uh, the migraine, 25% of the patients who are having migraine, they will have this oral symptoms, oral symptoms. Now, so, what are the triggers? So, who will have this migraine? Okay, the triggers. So usually, there will be a trigger point. Okay, there is a trigger for the migraine. What is the trigger? The triggers are going to be, in, especially in females, it's seen that menstruation. Okay, menstruation or stress or not eating properly, okay, not taking the food. So these are considered as a triggers. These are considered as a triggers for migraine. Okay, whenever the patient, you, whenever you sometimes, whenever you won't eat properly, then you will have the headache, severe headache. If it is coming on one side, you are having migraine. Okay, now what else? What is the treatment, sir? Treatment for the migraine. See, the triptans, the drugs called as a triptans. Especially that are called as a sumatriptan. Okay, it's a use. So sumatriptan, it is used. It's a, it's a, it's a five HT agonist. Okay, five HT five hydroxy tryptamine agonist. It's seen that, sir, in migraine, we don't know what exactly is causing the migraine. We don't know, but it's seen, it's understood that the migraine is because of irritation to the trigeminal nerve. It is observed. The scientists are still like you know finding out. It is seen that the, it's a trigeminal nerve activation, unnecessary trigeminal nerve activation and the irritation of the trigeminal nerve is the one which is causing the migraine. It is believed. So this sumatriptan, it's going to do what? Inhibition of. Going to cause inhibition of trigeminal nerve. That is the fifth cranial nerve. Fifth cranial nerve. Okay. The problem with this sumatriptan is, so sumatriptan is a vasoconstrictor. It's a vasoconstrictor. Sumatriptan is a vasoconstrictor. It is believed that it's a vasodilation. The irritation of the trigeminal nerve, one thing, that's irritation of the trigeminal nerve or the activation of the trigeminal nerve. Second thing, it's a vasodilation, vasodilation which is causing this migraine. It's thought that vasodilation is causing the migraine. Previously, long back, it is thought that the vasodilation, severe vasodilation is causing the migraine. So, this sumatriptan is a vasoconstrictor. The vasoconstriction so it decreases the migraine, it decreases the symptoms of the migraine. But the problem is, so it's a vasoconstrictor, right? So, what it will do, it increases the BP, that's a side effect. Sumatriptan increases the BP, sir. It's a vasoconstrictor, so uh, that's the one thing which is the problematic thing. Side effect is increasing the BP, and the second thing is so the sumatriptan, okay. Sumatriptan is contraindicated in patients who are having coronary artery diseases. So in coronary artery diseases, we want the vasodilation, not the vasoconstriction. So sumatriptan is contraindicated in coronary artery diseases, one thing, as well as in a patients with Prince metal angina. So Prince metal angina is a vasospastic angina. Okay, the coronary arteries are undergoing spasm. So in these patients with coronary artery diseases or Prince metal angina, or a patient who is having hypertension, don't give sumatriptan. Why? Because sumatriptan is a vasoconstrictant. It inhibits the trigeminal nerve. True. It is Agonist of 5 HT5 hydroxy tryptamine. Next. What else you can use for the treatment of this migraine? One thing you can use for the treatment of migraine is somatriptan, so the triptan group of drugs. How to treat the tension headache? The tension headache is treated with non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. Other things which can be used here in this condition are ergotamines. Okay, ergotamines. These ergotamines are also vaso 
constrictors. Remember the vasodilation, the severe vasodilation is thought to cause the migraines. Okay, severe vasodilation is thought to cause the migraines. So this ergot amines are the drugs which are vasoconstrictors. They can also be used in the treatment of migraine. And apart from that, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can also be used. So with this, completed. With this, the migraine topic is completed. Now after migraine, okay, after migraine, what else I want you to know? Is a cluster headache. Okay, cluster headache, sir. The cluster... Uh, one more point which I want you to know is, sir, this triptans, these are all tre treating the migraine. Right now, if you are having a migraine, right now, if you are having a migraine, we can use a triptans or ergotamines or non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. This can be used. How to prevent the migraine? Let me write that also. Prevention. Prevention of migraine. That's th th Those are also the MCQs which were tested in the exams. Prevention of the migraine. So the drugs like valproate and topiramate. I'm just trying to integrate, though these are the pathology classes, but just let me try to integrate. So what the drugs which are used to prevent the migraine? They are valproate and topiramate. These two are the anti-convulsant drugs, okay, anti-convulsant drugs. But the one, one important point which I want you to know is the valproate, one side effect of the valproate. So valproate causes weight gain. Okay, valproate causes weight gain. It's a hepatotoxic drug. Okay, it is hepatotoxic as well as it is associated with neural tube defects. Okay, if a female who is a pregnant, if a pregnant female, who, if she takes the valproate group of drugs, the anticonvulsant, she can have a baby with a neural tube defect, something like spina bifida. Okay, valproate. So, topiramate, important points are, so it causes the weight loss. That is the different. It causes the weight loss. But the important points which I want you to know is, so it causes kidney stones. Kidney stones. So why we are discussing about the valproate and topiramate? So these drugs are used for the prophylaxis of the migraine. So for the prophylaxis of the migraine, you can use the two important anti-convulsant drugs, anti-convulsant or anti-epileptic drugs, which are valproate and topiramate. Now, apart from this anti-convulsants, what else can be used in the treatment of migraine? The treatment of my migraine, what else can be used? It's the beta blockers. Okay, beta blockers. That is propranolol. Okay, propranolol, that's a beta blocker that can be used. The problem with the uh, propranolol is, you know it, okay, it can exacerbate the uh, asthma, it can exacerbate the asthma, okay, it, it is not like, you know, a very friendly drug in a, in a, drug in a patients who are having diabetes, right, because the, the diabetic patients, if they suddenly have hypoglycemia, okay, if you are using a beta blocker, the beta blocker can mask the symptoms, okay, you know, right, you, you know it, right, you study this in pharmacology, diabetic patients, if they are having, if they are having hypoglycemia, they will have some warning signs like tremors, sweating, these things will be there, okay, tachycardia will be there, but in a patient who is having diabetes mellitus, if he is on a beta blocker, if he is on a beta blocker, then these warning signs are masked, are not seen, are not seen, that's why, that's the one important point I want you to know. So beta blockers, they will exacerbate the asthma. Beta blockers are not used in a patient who is having diabetes mellitus. And beta blockers can also cause erectile dysfunction. Now the last thing, okay. Now, last type of headache is cluster. Sir, what is cluster? See, cluster headaches are especially seen in men's. Okay, where is uh, men, that to smokers. One important point is, sir, headache coming every day at the same time, okay. Every day, same time. For how much time? 15 to 15 minutes to almost hours. The same time, the headaches are coming. Where the headaches are coming, sir? It's a unilateral headache. Back to eye. The back of the eye. So, very severe pain is going to come uh, back to the eye. So, unilateral headaches back to the eye, especially seen in males who are smokers. So, it's following the circadian rhythm. Every day, it's going to come at the same time. Okay. The two behind the eye. So, these patients are going to have symptoms like lacrimation and rhinorrhea. That is a runny nose. Okay. Lacrimation can be seen. Rhinorrhea can be seen. Okay. These patients are also going to have autonomic dysfunctions like Horner syndrome. Okay, autonomic dysfunctions like Horner syndrome can be seen, like uh, ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis can be seen. These patients do not have any aura. Okay, no aura, no photophobia. These symptoms are not seen, sir, usually. Okay, so this is about the cluster headache. Important point is cluster headache, males, smokers, back to the eye. Okay, the back to the eye. Okay, every day at the same time. It will be long time, 15 minutes to hours. 
What is the treatment? So treatment for this cluster headaches is oxygen therapy. We don't know ex exact mechanism how it is helping, but giving oxygen and same triptans. Okay, triptans are seen to be effective for the treatment of clusters. Oxygen therapy and triptans are seen to be effective for the treatment of clusters. So that headache topic is a small thing, three types of headaches, cluster headaches, cluster headaches, tension headaches, as well as, uh, sorry, the, the, the second one, I forgot the name, the migraine, sorry, yeah, the migraine clusters as well as the tension headaches, their management, okay, their management and how it will be. Tension headache is going to be seen bilateral, migraine is going to be seen unilateral and clusters are going to be seen every day at the same time back to the eye. It's coming in clusters, cluster means every day at the same time headache is coming. For a few months it will come, it will stop, again it will come. So, headaches are also completed. The main topic for today is demyelinating disorders. Different demyelinating disorders. Again, tell me what are the different demyelinating disorders that we have discussed. So, the different demyelinating disorders that we have discussed are multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Okay. Next, Krabi's disease. We have discussed. We have discussed about um, metachromatic leukodystrophy and charcot Marie tooth disease. Out of this, which is inherited, inherited is charcot Marie tooth disease is inherited because of uh, which of them causing demyelination because of Lysosomal storage disorder, that's Krabis as well as, one is Krabis disease as well as metachromatic leukodystrophy. Okay. So, with this, completed sir, the central nervous system pathology topics which I want you to know are completed. Hope the video is helpful. See you tomorrow with the next video. Thank you.